This is so exciting. I'm so glad to see you all. Welcome to the 70th Conference on World Affairs. <laughs> it's so good to be here with all of you for what will, of course, be the best CWA ever. <laughs> sure. I'm Betsy Hand, Community and Programming Chair of the 70th Conference on World Affairs. And for the past year, I've been working with an awesome group of volunteers from this community and from the student body to put this conference together. And many of you are not working this very moment and are probably here in the audience, and I'd love to acknowledge you all. Would you stand up if you're a volunteer for this Conference on World Affairs? Where are you? Stand up. Yay. This is a big effort, and it takes a lot of people to make it happen, and I'm so grateful to you all. This kind of commitment makes CWA a unique gathering of thought leaders, artists, and performers in an amazing town-gown partnership that now celebrates this 70th anniversary. We've come a long way since 1948 when Howard Higman and a, and a group of CU professors brought together a group of ambassadors and thought leaders at that time to support the United Nations effort. The university has grown into a world-class institution since then with four campuses, Nobel laureates, MacArthur Fellows, and National Medal of Science winners. And the Boulder community has changed too. It's internationally connected, leading the world in tech, science, space, natural foods, innovators, and incubators. But what, yay, yay Boulder. But what hasn't changed is the beating heart of CWA. CWA events are free and open to the public and will remain free and open to the public. Our challenge then is to maintain and grow the magic of this 70-year tradition, even as we acknowledge the acceleration of change around us. Our success going forward will depend on the collaboration we celebrate today, the support of the university, and the generosity of the community and our speakers and performers. Our speakers and artists have come from around the nation and 22 countries this year. Many will be familiar to you and 60% will be newbies. Nearly half are women this year. That's a first and we're really, really proud of that. Our speakers exemplify the CWA commitment to exciting and civil conversation on issues that don't always lend themselves to easy dialogue and snappy one-liners. Our speakers have come to surprise us, entertain us, and most importantly, to challenge us to see things in new ways. Thank you, CWA participants. You're all here, thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Phil DiStefano, for your support. He's, he'll be here soon. Thank you, CU f faculty, community housers, donors, and sponsors. And thank you, CU students, and your fearless leaders, Tess Rose and Meredith Maney. Yay. <laughs> and as always, a very special thanks to my partner for two years, our faculty director, John Griffin, and our office team who took the program and made it happen today and for the next four days. Alan Culpepper, Katie Grady, and Aaron Rain. Thank you. So this has been a great partnership, and I'm so glad and proud to introduce the faculty director of CWA, John Griffin. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for the very kind introduction, Betsy, and congratulations to Betsy and her uh, 
tremendous program committee on a fantastic lineup this year. I also want to warmly welcome you to the 70th Conference on World Affairs. Many uh, organizations created 70 years ago are no longer with us. Indeed, most of them forgotten. I want to reflect briefly on the resilience of the CWA and my conclusion that the key to this resilience has been the CWA's ability to adapt. The writer H.G. Wells said, adapt or perish now as ever is nature's inexorable imperative. Or as Stephen Hawking wrote, intelligence is the ability to adapt to change. If Hawking's right, the CWA has been pretty smart over the years. Over its 70 years, the CWA has demonstrated a real ability to adapt topically as the world has become more complex the CWA has morphed from a conference largely and exclusively about world affairs to a conference about everything conceivable. Organizationally, as CU has changed and as the community has changed, the CWA has gone from being a largely campus event to being a largely community event to now being a real true partnership between the campus and the broader community. Financially, as legislative support for higher education has declined, the community has joined the campus in supporting the financial future of the CWA. And technologically, as the expectations of audience members have evolved, we've developed new technologies like the CWA app and other improvements to the conference. So, when the CWA turns 75 in 2023 and 100 in 2048, I'm not sure we'll, how it will have evolved or adapted. But one thing I am sure of is that the university and the community will make those decisions together. Before I introduce, <laughs> Before I introduce the chancellor, one quick programming note. After um, Tony Siba has finished his remarks, we will have audience Q&A, and that will be entirely through the CWA app, okay? So, uh, you can ask questions through the app. Uh, if you are a student, please indicate you're a student in your question. If you are uh, from watching this from some other location, please indicate that as well. So finally, it's my great pleasure to introduce CU Boulder Chancellor Philip DeStefano, who began his service to the university 44 years ago. This coming year will be his 10th as chancellor. He has been a dedicated champion of the CWA in his time as chancellor, and he and his wife, Yvonne, are true members of the CWA family. Please join me in welcoming our chancellor, Philip P. DeStefano. Thank you, John, and welcome to a one-of-a-kind, week-long festival of ideas featuring thought leaders from around the world and every field of endeavor. Thank you for joining us for this exciting week. And I want to thank John and Betsy, the entire staff of the Conference on World Affairs, and more than 100 student and 400 community volunteers who make this annual event possible. I also want to further acknowledge our long-standing collaboration with the Boulder community, whose partnership has made this conference a success for 70 years. 100 invited speakers take part in 200 panel discussions and performances over five days that attract an audience of 70,000 to the campus. The CWA helps us to develop tomorrow's leaders by pairing each of our speakers with a student ambassador studying in the speaker's area of expertise. And our hope is that these ambassadorships, if you will, offer significant professional mentoring opportunities for our students that will continue for years to come. Since 1948, the Conference on World Affairs has been relevant to our times, the community, and our university. Our vision at CU Boulder is to be a leader in addressing the humanitarian, social, and technological challenges of the 21st century. And this conference certainly personifies that. Today, I have the honor of introducing our keynote speaker, Tony Siba. Mr. Siba is a world-renowned author, thought leader, speaker, educator, 
and a Silicon Valley entrepreneur. He is the author of the number one Amazon best-selling book, Clean Disruption of Energy and Transportation, How Silicon Valley Will Make Oil, Nuclear, Natural Gas, Coal, Electric Utilities, and Conventional Cars Obsolete by 2030. He also wrote, He also wrote Solar Trillions and Winners Take All. He is co-founder of Rethink X, a think tank that focuses on technology disruption and its implications for society. Tony is an instructor at Stanford University's Continuing Studies program, where he has taught entrepreneurship, disruption, and clean energy. He holds an MBA from Stanford University Graduate School of Business and a Bachelor of Science in computer science and engineering from MIT. His keynote today is about clean disruption of energy and transportation, implications for cities and societies. Please join me in welcoming Tony Siba. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Boulder. Thank you. So great to be back. Um, today, I want to take you into the future. I want us to rethink the future. But before I do that, um, I want us to look at the past. Um, and so this is New York City, 1900. Um, we used horses for thousands of years as our main means of transportation. Thousands. Um, 1900 New York, in a sea of horses, there is one car. Can anyone see the one car in this picture? Um, there. One little car, right? And if anyone had stood there, here, um, and said that this thing called the internal combustion engine automobile was going to disrupt horses as a means of transportation, they would have said, you're insane, right? Um, New York City, 1913. Um, <laughs> there is one horse in this picture. <laughs> Can anyone see it? Yeah, so New York City went from all horse to all cars uh, in 13 years. That's a disruption. So what is, that was a technology disruption. And at the time, the, the technology was the automobile. Um, so what is the definition of a disruption? Uh, it's essentially when uh, technologies converge and make it possible for entrepreneurs and uh, companies to create new products and services that do two things. One, create new markets, and two, um, immediately or soon after, uh, essentially either destroy or dramatically transform uh, the existing industry. So if you think about uh, film photography, some of you who know what that is, uh, it was totally destroyed by digital. Uh, if you think about what Uber, for instance, and DD and Lyft uh, are doing ride hailing, they haven't destroyed the taxi industry, but they have radically transformed that industry. And either one is uh, a technology disruption. They were both possible because of convergence of technologies. And uh, from 1900, I'll take you to 1985, when um, the then largest company, telecom company in the world, AT&T, um, you know, they, they had this thing called the cell phone, you know, two pounds and uh, so on. And, uh, they hired consulting company McKinsey and they asked him one question, just one question. Um, what's going to be the market for cell phones in 15 years? So give me a prediction, a forecast for 2000, 15 years from now, um, of how many uh, people will use a cell phone. So they went off and did whatever it is that they do and they came back with this number, 900,000. <laughs> Uh, that's for America. In the year 2000, there's going to be uh, 900,000 subscribers. The actual number <laughs> was 100. I mean, 
this is the smartest kids from the smartest business schools, right? Um, and, you know, my little dog, um, I actually don't have a dog, but, you know, Winnie the Pooh, <laughs> you know, I did, but Winnie the Pooh could, could actually throw darts and, and, and do better than this. Um, uh, but, you know, the, the, the question that I ask myself, and of course, you know, AT&T's landline telephony business, gone. Um, but not only did they get disrupted, I mean, AT&T, the AT&T now is not the same as the AT&T then. Um, but also, when you don't get disruption, when you um, get attached to your existing business, um, essentially, you miss out on some potentially huge opportunities. So if you look at just the top seven companies in the mobile slash um, web space, that's $3 trillion in market capitalization. Just seven companies. And I'm not saying that AT&T could have um, grabbed all of that, but they could have grabbed uh, you know, a good chunk of that market because they were way ahead of the market. Um, and so that's what disruption does. Um, and you know, it's usually the experts and the insiders and the mainstream analysts who don't get it, who dismiss disruption opportunities. You know, this is the cover of Forbes magazine. Can anyone stop Nokia? This is from 2007. Now, what else happened in 2007? The iPhone, right? And, and, and Android. Um, and, and essentially, the mainstream analysts were saying, nah, not going to happen. I mean, you can't stop Nokia. So they don't get it. And, you know, I can give you example after example after example. Remember Kodak? <laughs> yeah? OK, some of you don't even know who that is. But, <laughs> you know, and, and, uh, I've made my point, right? The year 2000. But here's the thing about Kodak that a lot of people don't give them credit for. Kodak invented digital uh, imaging. They, they, they actually invested billions of dollars <clears throat> in digital imaging. Um, the person who discovered how quickly digital imaging was improving um, on a yearly basis was an employee at Kodak. Uh, they actually had a business plan for a $200 billion, uh, basically Kodak, in digital imaging. Hmm. And yet, they got disrupted. What's wrong with this picture? So I'm going to walk you through some of the main elements of basically how disruptions happen. And then I'm going to dive into uh, the disruption of energy and transportation. So over the last dozen years or more, um, I've been working on a disruption framework. Uh, because up to then, the idea was, let's look at disruption in hindsight and figure out how it happened. Um, and, and that's interesting, but not very useful if you're an, um, uh, an investor, if you're um, essentially studying, uh, if, you, you know, if your pension uh, is tied up to some uh, companies and so on. So I've worked on this framework for a while, and this is it. I'm going to walk you through some of the main elements. Um, one is, and one of the key things here is, technology cost curves. And the idea is that technologies improve um, on a yearly basis, many technologies. So solar PV improves since 70, since 1970, it's improved at about 11.5% 11, 11 per year. Um, the best known technology cost curve is, of course, Moore's Law. And Moore's Law says that uh, every two years, computing power doubles for the same dollar every two years. Now, how many doublings do you need until you get a 1,000 time improvement? 10 doublings, 20 years, right? So your iPhone, $700, the computing power would have cost 700,000 20 years ago, 700 million 40 years ago, and 700 billion 60 years ago. But also, if you look at the future, um, Essentially, the computing power will be 70 cents, right? What do you do with that? 
And, and those, that's the way in, in which you start thinking about the future. But it's not just about computing power. There's a whole number of technologies, digital imaging, uh, touch screen, uh, bandwidth, and so on, all of which are improving at different rates. So each one of them has a cost curve that is different. So when you think about what could potentially disrupt the market, you can basically converge, work on the convergence of these technologies. Um, and convergence is a very important point because folks talk about disruptive technologies. And yeah, some, some technologies are disruptive, but what I have found is that what enables disruptions is a convergence. It's not just one technology, is a technology convergence. And, and what does that mean? Um, so go back to 2007. Um, both the iPhone and Android came out 2007, the same year. So ask yourself, why not 2005 or 2009 or 11? I mean, you know, but they both came out 2007. The reason is that all the technologies that were needed for building a smartphone basically converged 2007. I mean, to, to make a $700 uh, smartphone possible happened 2007. So if you were paying attention, um, basically anyone could have built a smartphone. Nokia could have done it, remember Nokia? Um, Blackberry could have done it. Uh, basically anybody could have done it, but it ended up being Google and Apple. And that is another lesson in disruption. Disruptions happen from the outside. Uh, the incumbents are not the ones, traditionally, who enable disruptions. That's because they're addicted to the cash flow. I mean, you know, there's a reason why uh, they're incumbents. They're very successful at doing what they do, and they're addicted to that. And so they, they either don't see the disruption um, or basically dismiss it. And dismiss it because, you know, mainstream analysts tell them, ah, don't worry about it. It's not going to happen anytime soon. Um, so I follow, I wake up every morning and I follow these technologies, um, which, in my opinion and that of many of my colleagues, um, different convergence uh, points in different industries uh, of these technologies and others are going to enable, so the 2020s um, are gonna be the biggest, so every single industry in the world is gonna be disrupted in one way or another in the 2020s by a combination of these and other technologies. The 2020s are gonna be the most disruptive decade in history. Um, in history, bar none. Or as my friend uh, Hunter Lovin says, it's gonna be the mother of all disruptions. Uh, <laughs> now, I'm gonna walk you through some of it. Um, another very important point is um, that technology adoption doesn't happen linearly. It happens in S-curves. Every single successful technology in history, and I've looked at, well, maybe not all history, I've only looked back at 1454, that far back, but since then, um, every single technology ever, everywhere, gets adopted as an S-curve. So it may take a while until you hit a tipping point, but when it tips, it essentially grabs 80% of the market and wipes out the existing industry in weeks and months, in a in a few years, but um, it never happens linearly. It always happens as S-curves. And this is an example. This is a beautiful example of color television um, adoption in America, CDS. The, the question is, from our point of view, when is it going to tip? So at which point, because you know, solar, we've had solar for 40 years, 50 years. When is it going to tip? I'm going to tell you when, right? It may take decades before we hit that point, uh, but it's an S-curve. So cost comes down, and the S-curve happens. Uh, and, you know, it only takes a few years 
for it to go from a few percentage points, say 10% to, to 80%. Um, now, let me go back to the horse and the car uh, because you know, I, I get a lot of pushback from mainstream analysts. Uh, it's interesting, not from the oil industry so much as mainstream analysts. Uh, and so when we look at the adoption of the car in terms of passenger miles, not number of horses or vehicles, what we found was that it went from 11% to 80% in 10 years. 10 years. Now, this is what's interesting. So this is more than 100 years ago, right? Uh, when things didn't happen that quickly. Now things are happening much more quickly. Now, that happened while we built a brand new industry, the car industry, a brand new industry, the oil industry, a brand new road system. It took 10 years. And we fought a war. And while all of that happened, it still took 10 years from the tipping point to 80%. So whoever tells you a disruption in transportation cannot happen in 10 years, is not looking at the evidence. They're not looking at the data, right? I don't know what they're looking at. There's an echo chamber uh, that basically they live in, but they're not looking at the data because all of these S-curves are getting steeper and steeper and steeper. They're happening faster. If you look at how quickly technologies are getting to that 80%, uh, now they look like J-curves, just straight lines. It happens, it gets adopted or not, right? Or they die and then, which is fine because you know entrepreneurs can move on to the next thing. So disruptions are happening much more quickly, a lot more quickly. Uh, and if it happened in 10 years, 100 years ago, um, why would it not happen today? So um, why does it happen in S-curves? Well, there is a whole number of things, but adoption is exponential, dynamic, and systemic. So there are feedback loops, and you know, when your neighbor adopts, you're like, hmm, that's nice, maybe I'll buy it. And, so on, right? So, so th th there are all kinds of feedback loops, negative and positive, that, that enable a quick uh, um, transformation, a quick disruption. And yet, when you look at mainstream analysts, they still draw lines. I mean, I don't, look, this is the, the, the International Energy Agency, IEA. And every year they produce uh, an annual report, and every year they say, this is how solar is going to grow over the next decade or two. And every year, as you see, it's a line. Okay, so solar has been growing at 40% per year since 1990, right? So 1990, 40%, 40%, 40%. And so what does the IEA do? They go back and say, oh, it grew 40%, let's move up the line. Look, I mean, it's there, right? I mean, so, you know, 2010, it grows 40%. Okay, we'll move up the line. At which point do they get that this is an exponentially growing market, right? That is doubling pretty much every two years. Uh, they don't. You know, every year we get a line. Oh, it's going to be 10% by 2040 or whatever. Um, and even, even policy, policy innovation, which you know, we see as this very, very slow thing. Um, this is the S-curve, how quickly uh, uh, car taxes, uh, gasoline taxes, were adopted in America. So Oregon had the first uh, gasoline tax, and then within less than 10 years, every state in the union had gasoline taxes. Boom. Even policy innovations can happen that quickly. So 91% adoption in six years. Um, so, you know, when, when they have the right incentives, uh, even policymakers, um, you know, adopt in S-curves. Another very important point is business model innovation. Uh, and business model innovation is every bit as disruptive as technology innovation. And if you look at Uber, for instance, um, 
Uber is a business model innovation. It's not really about technology. Um, Uber is a uh, marketplace broker. The business model is not even new. I mean, it's an old business model that was made possible by the convergence of two disruptions. One is the smartphone and one is the cloud. So the smartphone happened 2007, Uber got started 2009. So it's a business model innovation, same thing with Airbnb. It's a business model innovation. And, you know, again, Uber and Lyft, um, I don't need to tell you how they've disrupted the taxi industry so far. In San Francisco, 20% of vehicle miles traveled today are Uber and Lyft. 20%. I mean, these are companies that didn't even exist 2008. 20%. And so from a disruption point of view, what I think is, hmm, what would it take for ride-hailing for that business model to go to 100%? Because if, it, if it's gone that, that quickly, uh, then there's something there. And also public transportation is being disrupted. And, you know, we, we, one of the pushbacks that I get um, is we love our cars, right? We love our cars. We're not going to give up our cars. Well, guess what? Um, ride-hailing is not just disrupting uh, taxis. Last year, almost 10% of Americans who traded in their cars did not buy a new one. 10%. And, you know, they're starting, they, they, they're using uh, right hailing. 10% is not a small number. I mean, this is, this is huge. So again, how do you grow that to, to 100%? Um, so business model innovation is really disruptive. Now, I take that framework, uh, and about four years ago, six years ago, and I wrote a book called Clean Disruption of Energy and Transportation. So I'm gonna walk you through the conclusions um, of, of that. And this is the, the executive summary. There are four technologies and um, one business model, all of which are disruptive. Uh, but together, when they converge and they enable one another, um, essentially they're going to wipe out disrupt all of energy and transportation as we know it, and it's going to be over by 2030. Not start, it's going to be over. Um, and I'm going to show you how. So I'm going to start with batteries, energy storage. And batteries are interesting because, you know, uh, battery, lithium ion batteries, uh, from 95 to about 2010, they had a cost curve of 14%. So 14% improvement in cost for performance per kilowatt hour every year. Um, and then over the following four years, it actually improved by 16% per year. So it accelerated. Why? Because two new industries came into that uh, product, auto and energy. Um, so when I wrote the book, uh, the cost curve was 16%. So I said, okay, let, let's assume that that 16% is going to continue over the next decade or two, um, and, and let's map out a disruption. What can uh, batteries disrupt at different cost curves? And what you hear from the experts is, oh, we need to get to this magic point. And when we reach that magic point, which is $100 per kilowatt hour, it's supposed to be like disruptive and it's the end of the internal combustion engine era and so on and so forth. That's not true. Because again, convergence happens at different points for different industries, for different markets. Uh, but by the way, uh, lithium ion, the build out of lithium ion uh, manufacturing capacity has increased exponentially by more than six times in three years alone. Uh, so, of course, what does that do? Learning curve, uh, 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 that makes the cost come down. So, in fact, over the last few years, the cost of lithium-ion batteries has come down by 20% per year. So, when I wrote Clean Disruption and I said, oh, it's going to come down by 16%, the expert said, 16%? What are you smoking? Uh, right? It's not going to happen. Well, they were right. It's 20%. <laughs> right, it's 20%. It's actually accelerated because 
of the build out of the, of the infrastructure. And now, um, even Dyson is getting into that business, has gotten into that business. Dyson. Now, Dyson is a what, vacuum cleaner company, and they acquired a company from Detroit, solid state batteries, and they have announced that um, they're going to build an electric car by 2020. 2020. Dyson. I mean, hello, isn't making cars difficult? I mean, don't you need to, like, do precision manufacturing and, you know, have 100-year history? Well, yeah, for an internal combustion engine automobile, but not for an EV, and I'll tell you in a second. But, you know, a vacuum cleaner company getting into electric vehicle, that is what I call a clean disruption. Um, I, I, sorry, uh, I, 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 I can't help it. Um, but so even at, even at today's cost of um, batteries, essentially what's called peakers, peaking power, mostly natural gas, is being disrupted. So now they're building huge uh, batteries, Southern California, Australia, and so on, that because you can store electricity, you don't need these peaking uh, uh, powers. And, and, and generation peakers are about a third of generating assets in the United States. A third of generating assets that are used only a few hours every year. Less than 6% of the time. What a waste of your money, right? Uh, of, of great their money. Uh, but Basically, we needed that because we didn't have uh, cheap enough batteries. We do now. At these costs today, essentially, peakers are being disrupted. And even in the conventional energy industry, they say by after 2020, we will never build another peaker. What they're not saying is that existing peakers are already stranded. Already stranded. Any peaker that you build today, gone, wiped out within a couple of years. Um, so, you know, peaking power, uh, gone, right? Because today, because of batteries. Um, and commercial businesses get uh, to pay 40, 50% of their electricity because of something called demand charges. Um, it, it doesn't have to do with energy itself, but when and how they use it. If you have a battery within your business, According to uh, uh, basically the U.S. government, um, five million U.S. businesses, according to NREL, um, can save money if they had a battery today. 25% of American businesses, they may not know it, but they can save money on energy. This is not, by the way, energy efficiency. This is, they're gonna use the same energy only they're gonna use it um, you know, whenever and they want, um, not at the rates that the, so essentially they're gonna store uh, energy when power is low and, and they're gonna use it when power prices are, are high, 25% at today's prices. And business model innovation is also important. It's also important because there are companies today that are going to these businesses, that are going to the hotels and the, and the 7-Elevens and so on, and they're saying, I'm gonna put a battery behind the meter and I'm gonna help you save 40, 50% of your uh, energy costs. Um, and by the way, you don't have to pay anything down. You take no technology risk, you take no financial risk. And by the way, I'll just take 50% of the savings. How about that? You take zero risk, there's only upside for you. That's a business model innovation. And that's happening today. Residential, right? Uh, residential uh, in many markets, uh, basically in the summer, uh, peaking prices, they can be 10 times more expensive, the rates, than at night. 10 times. Now, we have to pay that today, but when electricity storage, when batteries are cheap enough, essentially we don't have to. So, you know, if you pay five cents per kilowatt hour in the evening and 50, uh, basically from four to eight, all you need is four hours 
of electricity storage in your home to save a couple hundred bucks per, per month or whatever it is that your uh, bill is. And by 2020, American, the average American household will be able to have one full day of storage of electricity for a dollar a day. A dollar a day will keep the utility away. Um, by 2020, that's only two years away, right? But you don't need um, a full day of electricity storage. All you need is four hours because that's when the peak is. And just four hours of electricity storage by 2020 will cost $6 per month. Two lattes. <laughs> Two lattes a month, basically, uh, and ba you save on peaking power. And that's how the disruption of electric power is gonna happen. And as batteries get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, essentially, you know, it's easy to say uh, because you know, now we have batteries in every single one of our devices. Batteries are gonna be cheap enough that every home, every business, um, parking lots, every um, factory is gonna have batteries because it's gonna make sense. It's gonna make economic sense. Now, a disruption that batteries are gonna enable is the electric vehicle, the electric vehicle disruption. And I don't need to tell you, some of you drive uh, EVs, uh, Tesla Model S, you know, best car ever made. Uh, Consumer Reports gave them 103 rating out of 100. Um, yeah, that's like 11, right? It's not 10, it's 11. Um, I couldn't make that up, by the way. Um, and, and after that, two more EVs, the Bolt and the Tesla Model 3 have got uh, car of the year. Uh, but of course, the question is, who can afford an electric vehicle? And I can't, right? I mean, yeah, I'm worried. <laughs> I'm wearing the same suit, right? I mean, uh, uh, yeah, 10, years, 10 years later. Um, but, you know, the question is, is the EV disruptive? Is the EV disruptive? Uh, or is it just a nice, you know, greeny kind of uh, product, right? So let me give you a few reasons why the electric vehicle is disruptive. One is that uh, the electric powertrain, the electric motor, is up to five times more energy efficient in converting the energy in the battery into actual usable power. Um, I mean, today we waste 80% plus of the diesel or the, the, the gasoline in the car, we waste it because it's very inefficient. Now, that in and of itself is not what's disruptive. When you combine that with the fact that transporting and creating electrons, electricity, uh, is much cheaper than transporting fuel, atoms, um, gasoline or diesel, you get that on a per mile basis, EVs are 10 times cheaper uh, to fuel or charge. On a per mile basis, 10x. 10x is a sign of disruption. Um, you know, maintenance, how much do we get to spend? This is your car, uh, basically. It has more than 2,000 moving parts. 2,000 moving parts. Uh, the EV has 20. Okay, Model S is 18. 20, from 2,000 moving parts to 20. This is how a Dyson can make an electric vehicle. This is how a high school team can make an electric vehicle, 20 moving parts. And they don't even touch. Many of them don't even touch because magnetic and, and all that good stuff. Um, the other thing about partly because of this, EVs last forever. I mean, at least we know that they last at least 500,000 miles. Uh, and maybe a million miles uh, versus 140 for the internal combustion engine automobile. Now, we only drive 10,000 miles a year. So is having a 500,000 mile uh, car really that disruptive? I mean, who drives uh, the same car for 50 years? Unless you live in Cuba, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but if... If you're a fleet, though, if you're Uber, if, if you're FedEx and, and uh, Lyft and DD and so on, you do drive 100,000 miles a year. Now it gets interesting if you're a fleet because you can use one car, one EV in five years, um, or two and a half internal combustion engine cars over five years. So suddenly the, 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 the equation shifts when you're talking about fleets. Uh, because 
uh, at that point, then internal ICE vehicles are two and a half times more expensive uh, over five years, 500,000 miles. And I'm going to come back to that. And EVs are also more powerful, way more powerful than internal combustion engine. Um, you know, this is a university team in Switzerland that built an EV that beat the, the, the Porsche 918 Spider uh, that costs a million dollars. So if anyone here has a Porsche, uh, you know where to head um, because you know what the value of that car is going to be. But, uh, you know, a university team beat Porsche. Okay? How cool is that? Um, so that, that gives you an idea that, that EVs are so much more disruptive. And by the way, you know, your 200-mile your EV can store two full days of electricity in the average American home. Two full days of electricity. Try that with a VW diesel. Uh, okay? Um, so, you know, what about the cost? So, in, in, again, in 2014, I drew this cost curve at 16% uh, battery cost curve. And this is what I got. I got that by, essentially, 20, uh, by this time, uh, essentially 2018, we would have electric vehicles with 200 mile range in the 35 to $40,000 price, unsubsidized. Uh, and guess what we have? We have already two of them. Um, and of course, at the time, folks said, oh, you're insane, not gonna happen, and so on. Well, it has happened. Um, but what this curve also says is that by 2020, well, the average American new car is 33,000. By 2020, an EV with 200-mile uh, range is going to be 10, 20% cheaper to buy than a nice car, um, ice car, not nice car. Um, and it's going to be 10 times cheaper to buy, I mean, 10 times cheaper to maintain, 10 times cheaper to fuel, and it's essentially going to last forever. What? Oh, and it's more powerful. So you'll be able to buy Porsche Performance for Buick prices. What do you think the market's going to do? I mean, what do you think the market's going to buy? Right? And if you keep going down that cost curve, essentially what it means is this. By 2025, assuming that we keep the existing model of individual ownership, which is not going to happen, and I'm going to tell you why. But assuming that that's the case, um, by 2025, every new car will be electric. By 2025 for purely economic reasons. By 2025, every tractor, every bus, every truck is gonna be, new truck is gonna be electric. That's what the cost curve says, uh, for purely economic reasons. Um, and you know, there's even a $5,000 EV with a 100 mile range in China today. Today, you can buy the 100 mile range, $5,000. Um, so, and you know, I don't need to tell you about Tesla Model S, you know, 500, Thousand people have put up about a thousand dollars each to wait to have the right to drive this car when it comes out. This is the latent demand for a car of that quality in the 35 to 40,000 mile range. Um, but as disruptive as that is, did I say by 2025 every new vehicle will be electric? By 2025, um, there's an even bigger. Uh, there's another technology that, that is even more disruptive, and that's autonomous vehicles. And I'm going to show you a quick video um, of, the, of Waymo, formerly known as Google. Now, this is happening today. This is Phoenix, Arizona. Um, Waymo already has a service that uh, has level four self-driving. Level four self-driving means no humans needed at all. I mean, they, they have the steering wheel just for show. Uh, they, they, they actually don't need a, a steering wheel uh, or a pedal. Level four means just computers, uh, essentially. And they have the service in Phoenix today, today. Um, and they essentially have announced that they're gonna blanket Phoenix with these vehicles, autonomous and electric um, and on demand, so uh, basically competing with the Ubers of the world. Uh, by the end of this year, they're, they're, they have a 600 square mile 
geo fence, which covers pretty much all of Phoenix, uh, and which covers every city in America except four, I think. Um, and and it, it's ready. I mean, it, it, it's there. Um, it's not that we need to wait that, that long, but it's not about Waymo. Um, today we have 40, 50 companies that are spending, investing billions and billions of dollars in autonomous technology. Billions of dollars. Now, why are they investing? And this is not just startup companies. I mean, these are the incumbents that are getting into this space. I mean, GM has said, we're a transportation as a service company now. We're not a car company anymore. Um, why are they doing that? Uh, so I'll tell you why. Because, well, first of all, uh, there's, there's a lot of, you know, the experts and so on saying that uh, we need uh, level five or we need, uh, you know, all kinds of things. All we need is one. It's like having a spouse, right? All you need is one. Uh, the history of computing says, uh, um, so uh, uh, an, elect, uh, an autonomous vehicle, an AV, is a computer on wheels. You don't need a human at all to drive. Um, and if you look at the history of computing, uh, you learn many things, but two things. Uh, one, all you need is one. I mean, Apple did not wait for anybody else be, when they went out with the, with the smartphone, with iOS. Once iOS was ready, they were, you know, off to the races. And then came Google with Android, and that's another lesson. Basically, because of something called network effects, um, only two operating systems survive. Maybe a third, Linux, but no more than that. So all you need is one in order for this market to start taking off. And in the end, only two or three are going to survive. Um, what about the cost? Aren't these things expensive? I'm going to show you the cost curve of two essential technologies for self-driving. And one is computing. You do need a supercomputer in the trunk to process all of this information. And this is what an autonomous vehicle sees when it uses a sensor. So that, that hat on top of those cars, that's, a, that's called LIDAR. Laser, uh, like laser and radar. It emits about a million pulses of, of, of laser per second, about 100, 200 yards. And they bounce back like a radar and, and, and per second, a million per second. And it creates a real-time view of the world. Um, so you do need, like, supercomputing power. Now, let me show you the, both the cost curves of LiDAR and supercomputing. Um, so LiDAR, when, in 2012, was $70,000. $70,000. So what did the experts say? Autonomous technology. Not going to happen. I mean, this is twice the cost of an average car. Not going to happen, right? Not now, not in the next generation. Well, what did happen was that the cost of LiDAR went down exponentially. So the next gen was 10,000, and, and then a, a Silicon Valley company came out with, um, and actually they're producing it, a $1,000 LiDAR, 1,000. It's in the market already. Um, that company's making a ton of money selling that from 70,000 to 1,000. Not bad, right? Um, the, the, that, same that same company called Quantergy uh, actually came out with a $250 LiDAR, about the A big, um, 250 from 70 grand to 250 in about six years. That is what technology cost curves do. So LiDAR, even if you put four, because it's yay big, uh, and I'm going to show you what, what it looks like. Oh, by the way, in their next generation, LiDAR is going to be $90. 90. You'll be able to plug it into your iPhone. Now, what you're going to do with it, I don't know, but, uh, <laughs> but it's going to be $90. What disruptions that's going to enable, uh, we'll see, because there are entrepreneurs already working on that. Now, this is the Fisker uh, electric, autonomous electric vehicle that is announced to come out 2020, and it has five LIDARs, five. Can you see them? Yeah, because, you know, essentially they're this big. They're part of the car. You don't see the hat that says, I'm an AV, I'm, you know, autonomous, hit me, hit me, hit me, right? Because, uh, you know, um, yeah. So, essentially, um, 
What about computing? Because you do need a supercomputing uh, power to make this happen. Now, in 2000, this was the world's most powerful supercomputer. That's Andia National Labs. It was one teraflops of computing power for about $50 million. One teraflops. Um, year 2000. Now, last year, uh, the eight teraflops computer that Jensen Wang is holding in his hand was 600 bucks. Should I say that again? Uh, okay, that's a 600,000 plus improvement in uh, pricing for the same performance, 600,000. Um, and this is what you need for a level four car. Um, and you know they announced their next generation, which is gonna be four, 40 times more powerful. And according to them, that's what they need to uh, run level five. And level five means you can drive on, or it can drive in any circumstance, sleet, snow, rain, you know, fog, Oslo, Boulder, San Francisco, it doesn't matter, Kenya, New Delhi. Um, so here's another interesting thing about, so cost is not the issue. Cost is not gonna be an issue for AVs. Now, um, the other thing to, to, to uh, think about when we're rethinking the future is this. These are operating systems that they're building. And, and all of these parts are portable. Basically, you can take them down from a robot all the way to a truck and more. So, you know, just like we have small uh, smartphones and large smartphones and iPads and bigger iPads and so on and so forth, it's the same operating system and the same technology pretty much. So everything that moves uh, basically on roads is gonna be autonomous uh, at some point, right? When? I'm gonna tell you when. Uh, and of course, that enables product innovation. There's gonna be a whole host of new products uh, enabled by these technologies. Uh, like delivery. So you'll be able to, you know, if you're a retailer, deliver products um, basically with, with autonomous uh, little delivery vehicles or postal service or uh, so on. And basically th this already exists. I mean, this is not in the future, this already exists. And there are things that could accelerate the disruption. Uh, like what? Well, uh, what's gonna determine uh, the winner is probably gonna be computer simulation. Because, you know, Waymo has done, oh, something like 10 million miles in nine years uh, of actual road miles. But they do 10 million miles in the computer, in computer simulation. And in simulation, 10 million miles per day, right? That's billions of miles uh, that they can do every year. And, you know, in, in computers you can, do anything you want. You can throw an elephant in the middle of the highway and see what happens, right? Um, and so computer simulation is going to accelerate how quickly we get to level four and five and so on. And the other one is open source. And Baidu, which is uh, the Google of China, is investing 20, 25% of their revenues in self, they're betting their company on self-driving technology. Uh, and it's open source, just like Linux, it's open source. Uh, and so they have a ton of companies that are partnering with them, helping them develop that software. So that accelerates it. And so the question is, are consumers ready for you know, autonomous vehicles? So my old company, Cisco, did uh, a study around the world. And you know, some countries, consumers are saying, bring it on right now, bring it on, right? 86%, 90%. So, you know, if we're afraid, for whatever reason, uh, China's not, India's not, Brazil is not, they're actually saying, bring it on right now. Why? This, this is my best estimate as to, as to why they don't wanna drive, right? Okay, so, so this is cool, we're gonna have cars that so we don't drive, where's the disruption? Um, which is gonna be a big bang disruption. And, um, I did a follow-on study, so I created a new think tank called RethinkX, um, and we run the data again and do, did another analysis, and uh, this is what we came up with, that it's gonna happen a little bit faster than what I thought initially, uh, in, you know, 2030 and so on, but let me, let me first let me tell you this. Uh, your car is your second largest capital expenditure, middle class, uh, after our house. And yet, we only use it 4% of the time, 4%. We park it 96% of the time. 
that is such a waste of money and space and everything, right? Um, so what is the disruption of transportation? Um, so the, the EV curve that I showed you, it's not quite going to happen that way. Transportation as a, as a service is the convergence of three things. Ride hailing, this is model innovation, electric vehicles, and autonomous technology. So that's, remember 2007, the convergence of, um, that made the smartphone possible? We expect, uh, essentially, that convergence, uh, on-demand, autonomous, and electric, to happen around 2021. Now, I showed you that Waymo is making it happen this year, uh, but let's assume 2021. And uh, take into account that fleet, the Ubers of the world and so on, drive about 100,000 miles uh, per year, as opposed to individuals who drive 10,000 miles. So when you put that together, essentially what you get is this that on a five-year, 500,000-mile basis, uh, the cost of on-demand, autonomous, electric is going to be two and a half times cheaper than on-demand, autonomous, and uh, combustion. So fleets like Uber and DD and Lyft have to go electric for purely economic reasons not because of green reasons, but because of green reasons. And when you see what's going on out there, uh, basically, um, it, it, it's already happening. Um, so Waymo uh, has ordered 20,000 Jaguar I-Pace electric that they're gonna deploy over the next couple of years. 20,000 order, $2 billion order. Um, I mean, they, they started, they have about 600, combustion uh, automobiles, and now they're ordering 20,000. So they're already making the transition to electric because of purely economic reasons. DD, which is the largest ride-hailing company in uh, the world, way bigger than Uber, said that by 2020, they're gonna have a million electric vehicles. One company, their company's network is gonna have one million electric vehicles. So basically, the leaders in the space are already making that transition. And just to give you an idea of what a fleet uh, service, right, transport as a service, can do with one million EVs, uh, basically the, they can drive the equivalent of a third of all the passenger miles in California, which is the largest uh, you know, car market in the US. A third, and that's just with one million EVs. Um, so, transportation as a service is what? On-demand, autonomous, and electric, owned by fleets, not individuals, fleets. Now, why fleets? Don't we love our cars? Well, yeah, but not that much. Um, 2021, assuming 2021 is when, regulators, when level four technology is ready and accepted by the regulators, um, that day, the cost per mile of uh, on the task of AEVs is going to be one tenth of the cost per mile of, 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 of car ownership, whether it's EV or ICE. One tenth. 10x cost difference for similar products or services has always caused a disruption. Always. Every single time in history, 10x has caused, uh, cost, uh, has caused a disruption. Every single time. Right? If anyone here finds an example that contradicts me, please let me know. Uh, but I, I've never found one. Um, and so 10x is going to cause a disruption. What happens in 2021 when someone goes to buy a car? This is the decision that they need to make. Do I want to spend $50,000 over the next five years in owning a car? I was going to say a brick. Um, or do I want to spend 100 bucks a month as a service, right? I mean, do I want to buy a subscription just like a Netflix or, um, you know, software or whatever, music? You know, essentially, people are going to stop buying cars where TAS is available. 50% uh, of American families have less than $1,000 of savings in the bank. 50% of American families have less than $1,000 in the bank. 
what do you think they're going to decide? Do you think they're going to add $50,000 debt? Doesn't, right? I mean, uh, and there are so many people who don't have access to, to, to car. So essentially, people are going to stop buying cars. Um, and it's going to be a very quick disruption. By, and, and I'll tell you how quickly it's going to happen. By 2030, uh, when we model this, 95% of all passenger miles in America uh, are going to be TAS, on-demand, autonomous, and electric. 95% of all miles. Now, this doesn't mean 95% of car ownership. We still see 60-40. We still see 40% of cars being owned by individuals, but they drive 10,000 miles a year. So the 60% fleet cars are going to drive 100,000 miles a year, and they're going to contribute 90 5% of the miles, 95%. By 2030, this is going to be a 10-year disruption. Uh, now, what are the implications? Implications. Um, the size of the fleet, so new cars are going to, basically sales of new cars are going to crash immediately. Uh, because the size of the fleet, individuals are going to stop buying cars. Um, the size of the fleet that we're going to have of the whole fleet in America, which is now about 250 million cars, is going to shrink by about 80%. So new vehicle sales are going to basically uh, collapse immediately. And new vehicle sales are going to be, of course, autonomous and electric. Otherwise, you're out of business. Uh, but even if you are in business, the size of the market is going to shrink by about uh, 70%. Um, implications for the oil industry. Yeah. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> this is for purely economic reasons, right? I mean, this is all happening for purely economic reasons. Um, essentially, we see um, 2020 is going to be peak demand for oil, uh, assuming that uh, AEVs are approved 2021. So the year before uh, is going to be the peak demand at about 100 million barrels per day. Um, and it's going to go down volume of oil to about 70 million barrels by, by 2030, uh, because everything new is going to be electric. Uh, but prices are going to collapse immediately. So even though volume is going to go down you know, kind of smoothly, uh, prices are going to collapse immediately. Why? Because as we learned from 2014, uh, all you need is a 2 million barrel oversupply in the market for prices to crash. And at 70 million, the equilibrium price is going to be $25. Equilibrium. Now, there's going to be disequilibrium for a while. I mean, I know a, an oil CEO who told me, you know, I'm getting ready for $15 a barrel. Why? I mean, it was 11 and 99. Why not 15? Uh, so price is going to collapse, let's say, to 25. What does that mean? And it's going to collapse immediately. That's going to be 2021 or 2. It's not going to be 2030. What does that mean? Well, it means that any oil that can't compete at 25 is going to be stranded. Any oil. Sands, gone. Shale, gone. Deep water, gone. If you can't compete at 25, essentially you're gone forever because oil prices are going to keep crashing uh, because there's going to be a lot of oversupply for a long time. Gone. Not only uh, lifting, but also all the assets associated with oil. Uh, you know, pipelines that serve all of these areas, gone, right? Refineries that serve these, uh, the, these types of oil, gone. Because, of course, we're not going to pump that oil. And that's going to happen in the early 2020s. That's the implication. Any new oil, any new capital that's going into pumping oil today, gone, right? Within four or five years. Um, what are the implications for uh, society? Financial. The average American family is going to save about $6,000 a year, right down to our pockets. $6,000 a year by choosing, essentially, this autonomous electric vehicle that can take us and our kids and our parents um, uh, to, to work and basically drop us off and then go pick up somebody else and so on and so forth. 
Um, and that's a trillion dollars in additional GDP. Uh, additional to that is that the time that we waste driving, uh, and if we do anything else, we study, we teach, we consult, we, we, we sleep, uh, that time is gonna uh, essentially add another trillion dollars per activity to the US economy, two trillion dollars in, in uh, basically uh, addition to consumer, to the, to the GDP. Social, for the first time in history ever, um, there's gonna be cheap, convenient transportation available to all. The very young who can't drive, the very old who can't drive or doesn't have access to public transportation, the poor who live too far away from jobs uh, to basically have access to those jobs. There are plenty of jobs that they don't have access to because of really bad public transportation. Um, so for the first time in history, everyone, everyone uh, is gonna have access to cheap, convenient transportation. Um, more uh, environmental, essentially we're gonna see 90% decrease in CO2 emissions from road transportation by 2030. And this is gonna happen for purely economic reasons. This is not gonna happen, I mean, the old narrative that, oh, we need carbon taxes, we need this, we need the government to help, no. This is gonna happen because consumers, us, are gonna make the rational choice to spend 10 times less for transportation than we pay now. Uh, so that's a major implication for the disruption of transportation. Geopolitical. So, you know, essentially we're gonna be uh, free, uh, energy, free of oil, uh, you know, both domestic and uh, imports for the first time and since I remember, free of imported oil. Now, oil is not gonna go away. I mean, you know, there, there's still plastics and, and stuff that are made with oil, uh, but we're not gonna need it for transportation. Now, what does that mean from a geopolitical point of view? Does that mean that we're gonna withdraw from the world? Does that mean that there are gonna be isolationist tendencies in America that are actually gonna say, you know what? We don't need to patrol the world for oil or invade anybody or whatever. So the world is going to change dramatically because we're not going to need to import oil. And, and not, not just us, but China and India and so on. Um, essentially, oil is gonna, not gonna be needed for transportation. Um, parking. 80% of parking, gone. Gone, yeah? Because we're gonna have 80% fewer cars that drive better than humans, meaning you know, they, they don't need as much space in highways or uh, roads and so on uh, to, to drive. So essentially parking, especially in the cities, in the downtowns, empty. And I did the numbers for, for Los Angeles. Um, and in Los Angeles with the empty parking, you will be able to fit in three cities the size of San Francisco with parking and all um, in the empty space left by um, parking, vacant parking in Los Angeles. Um, so we have to make these choices today. What do we do with all of this empty space, which in some cities is about a third of the size, the land mass of the cities is parking. What are we gonna do? Uh, affordable housing, more business, green parks, yes, yes, and yes, because there's gonna be a lot of new, uh, uh, basically, uh, space that's gonna open up, but we have to make those decisions today. Um, and of course, uh, you know, the whole urban landscape's gonna be redesigned. Uh, roads, highways, uh, everything is gonna be redesigned because of the uh, disruption of transportation, because a third of, uh, uh, essentially, uh, cities is, is gonna open up. Um, so we'll be able to, to decide, to ask this question and answer it. Who do we want to be? What city do we want to be, uh, essentially, in about 10 years? But we have to start making those decisions today. And last but not least, I'm gonna run through how do we power all of this. Uh, and this is uh, Copenhagen. Uh, has anyone, did, who's from Copenhagen, Denmark? Yes. Um, how sunny is it in Copenhagen? I, I love Copenhagen. Yeah, not, not so much, right? Yeah. So, 
so this, this is a school in, in, in Copenhagen that, that essentially uh, generates 100% of its energy with solar power. Copenhagen is at the same latitude as Juneau, Alaska. So the excuse, oh, we're you know, not sunny enough or whatever, doesn't really work. If Copenhagen uh, can generate 50%, it can happen. And so again, solar is a technology. It's come down in cost by 11.5% per year since uh, 1970. And the market has grown by 40% per year, basically doubling every two years since at least 1990, right? So how many more doublings? Now it's at about 2% of generation. How many more doublings until, if it keeps growing at this rate, solar is 100% of all generation? Now we can do anything in a spreadsheet, let's do it. Um, 2%, one doubling, four, two doublings, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128. We need six more doublings, 12 years, for solar to be 100% of all energy. Now, is that possible, right? Can it continue growing at that rate? If you look at every other source of energy, conventional energy, coal, uh, oil, nukes, and so on, they've all gone up by six to 16 times since 1970. At the same time that uh, solar has come down by 300 times. So, you know, essentially solar right now is cheaper than what we buy from the electric utility in 80% of uh, the world. Not bad for uh, an industry in crisis, right? 80% of the world, we can put up rooftop solar. 69% of corporations are, are looking at solar right now. And they, they're looking at solar for purely economic reasons. Not because they're green, but because, again, of this green. Uh, and some companies are choosing to get off the grid because of this, because they can generate at a much cheaper rate uh, than what the utility offers, right? Now, because of this, the 40% the, the, the may ac actually accelerate. The, the question is, is there an S-curve? And what is the tipping point? So essentially, I, I created a new term. I call it God parity. It's not religious. Uh, it's generation on demand, which says this. Um, at some point in the next few years, and this has already happened in a few markets, the cost of rooftop solar plus batteries is going to be cheaper than the cost of transmission. Transmission. So even if the utilities generate at zero, when you add the cost of transmission, it's still going to be more expensive than self-generation and storage. That's called God parity. At that point, it becomes in everyone's every company, every individual's best selfish economic interest to put up solar and batteries uh, in their house, in their factory, and, and so on and so forth. And that is the tipping point. The tipping point is God parity. Now, when is that gonna happen? It's already happening in many countries. It's already happened in Australia. Uh, Australia, solar is seven cents. Transmission is 12 cents. Australia, residential solar, 25% of the market. Uh, so it's happening already in many countries, and it's essentially by 2021, we'll see this basically in every large market around the world. And utility scale, we are going to need still large, you know, generation sources, wind or solar or whatever, uh, to power data centers and to power aluminum smelters and so on. Solar is already at 1.8 cents. Solar unsubsidized is already the cheapest form of energy, period. Today, 2018, not 2030, 2018. Today, there is no excuse to build a new coal plant. None, right? None, not, not financial, right? Um, no excuse to build a new gas plant, no excuse to build a new nuke, none. The solar is already the cheapest form of energy. But what about dispatchable? What about in, in the evening and so on? Um, solar plus storage is already at four and a half cents. It, again, cheaper than almost anything else, right? And all of these costs are coming down. Now, since we're in Colorado, um, I wanted to show the, the last RFP from, from Excel for uh, essentially clean energy. 
this is what came back. They wanted about you know, 700 megawatts. And essentially what came back is this. Wind plus solar plus storage, so essentially 24-7 clean energy, three cents per kilowatt hour. Three cents per kilowatt hour. This is the median that came back. They haven't given us details, but I know at least one company uh, who told me that they offered two cents. Two cents for solar plus wind plus storage, two cents. This is not just cheaper than any other source of energy. Um, this is cheaper than the cost to operate any other source of energy. This is, this, this is cheaper than the marginal cost of coal, gas, nukes, anything already. This is 2018. So from now on, any investment in conventional energy is essentially stranded, gone gone. And you don't want to be stuck with that uh, debt. So let me take you back to the future. Um, we are today essentially driving um, typewriters on wheels. <laughs> Dirty ones, right? Um, and if you don't know what a typewriter is, <laughs> I've made my point, right? Um, that, that's what we're driving. And this disruption is going to happen really, really quickly. I mean, by 2030, it's over. And we're on the cusp of that disruption to happen. On the cusp of the deepest, fastest, most consequential, consequential because everything is going to change. Everything depends on energy and transportation, water, food, cities, the built environment. Everything depends on it. We're on the cusp of that happening. The tipping point is 2020, 2021 and it's gonna be over by 2030. And the last point I'm going to make is this. This is not an energy transition that's gonna be you know, pushed by governments and so on and so forth. This is a technology disruption. It's gonna happen for purely economic reason, and it's gonna happen despite governments, not because of governments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Audi audience members, if you could hold your seats for a moment to allow the speakers to depart first. There's some 1 p.m. panels that are beginning, so the speakers need to move on. The afternoon sessions will begin at 1.05 to um, account for the fact that we're running a little bit behind. Uh, Please join me again in thanking Tony Seba. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I believe Tony will be available for some brief questions in the lobby um, if you would like to ask him a question. out in the foyer.